Good morning. Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Lent. Glad that you're here. Uh, I remind you that next Sunday we will be worshiping in the sanctuary. Praise the Lord. Uh, that's the first day of spring. What a great day that will be. New beginnings, a new worship experience back in the church. It's been over a year now. Uh, we will continue to stream the service live beginning next week from the sanctuary. Uh, that's been a, a very needed service, a needed ministry, so that will continue. Uh, tomorrow or today we are in the garden, so make time to view that service, I think, on Sunday night. Is that right, Seth? Sunday night. Please note all the prayer concerns in the bulletin. Our midweek meditation will occur this week, hopefully. Uh, the time and Zoom link for that is in your bulletin. Please lift up Mike Black in your prayers as he recovers from surgery as well as Sam Pace. We will also notify you this week of Holy Week times and services. We will have a Monday, Thursday service, a Good Friday service, and, and perhaps two Easter services. So things are, are really looking much better for us as we return to worship in God's house. May we prepare our hearts to worship God. <coughs> May we join together now in our call to worship. Pilgrims, we are invited to journey through this season of Lent towards the one who calls us each by a new name. Disciples, we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us, pulling our fears, our doubts, our longings behind us. Believers, we seek to trust the God who, who always surprises us, who promises to take us who promises to take on flesh and blood in the good news called Jesus. May we pray. Though people may turn their backs on us, you do not hide your face from us. Though others may try to take away our hope, you assure us of that future waiting for us. You speak your name, inscrutable creator, and it is enough. When we try to dictate our fears to you, you invite us to follow into self-denial, and service. As we struggle to shape our lifestyle to yours, you carry us with you wherever we go. You speak your good news, teacher of open hearts, and it is enough. Though we have done nothing to earn them, you pour out the gifts of grace and mercy upon us. When we stumble over our lack of trust, you set us back on our feet to follow you into the kingdom. You speak your peace, breath of holiness, and it is enough. God in community, holy and one, it is enough that we, that you hear us even as we pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You see that our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 379. Amen. Join me now in the call to reconciliation. How often have we heard the good news of forgiveness and restoration, yet we are still reluctant to believe? God offers us new life, yet we are afraid to to let go of the old. Let us confess our doubts and fears to the one who, who waits to make us whole. We use a lot of words, gracious God but do little to turn them into deeds. Instead of being of one heart and soul, we choose sides and form groups of folks just like us. Blessed with great grace, we have trouble sharing it with those who who need it the most. Forgive us, God of love. Forgive us as we step out of our shadows into your light. Restore us as we reveal our brokenness. Hear us as we proclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord and our God. Amen. Hear now the good news. This is the good news we have to declare. 
God leads us out of the shadows to walk in the light of Christ. This is the word we, we have heard. Our faithful God forgives our sins and raises us to new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time I invite the young people to gather around for the children's moment. Good morning. I hope to see as many of you as possible next Sunday in the sanctuary for our service. Um, I've missed you. Can you see this piece of paper? Seth, can they see that okay, you think? One big piece of paper. What do you see? What's the first thing you see on this paper? I'm going to put Seth on the spot. What do you see, Seth? Black dot. You see a black dot. That's right. On this big piece of paper, what do you see? You see a black dot, a dark spot. That's the first thing you see, right? Okay, now I'm going to see if you see something different. Now what do you see? What do you see? I can't hear you. Seth? A black dot. Well, maybe I'm going to pick on Seth this morning, who's behind the camera. Yes, I guess there's a black dot on here, but when I look at it with a clean heart, I don't see a black dot. I see a big white piece of paper that just happens to have a small dot in the middle. What's the biggest thing on this paper, the black dot or or the whiteness of the sheet of paper. The whiteness of the sheet of paper. It's really just a small black dot. And everyone would say, I see a small black dot. But sometimes we Christians look at other people and we see that one dark spot in their lives and we fail to see all the bright things in their lives. And we have a way of, of probably pushing those people aside we always see something wrong with that one person, that small little thing that drives us crazy, but we don't see all the other beautiful, bright things in their lives. So when you look at someone this week, look with the eyes of God. See if you can find the brightness in their lives, not that one troubled, dark spot. Can you do that this week for me? Seth, can you do that? Let's say a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for cleaning us and making us white, even white as snow, as we said a few weeks ago. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Turn with me now to our scripture reading, first of all from Hosea, beginning with chapter 5, verse 15, through chapter 6, verse 6. May we listen carefully for God's Word to all of us. I will go away and return to my place until, the acknowledge, until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction they will earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, for He has torn us, but He will heal us. He has wounded us, but He will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day, that we may live before Him. So let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. He's going forth. His going forth is a certain is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. What shall I do with you, Ephraim, and what shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a, a morning cloud, and like the dew which goes away early. Therefore I have hewn them in pieces by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. For I delight in loyalty and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And now these words from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 9 verse 9 through 13. And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And it happened that as he was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax gatherers and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax gatherers and the sinners? But when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I, am, for I do not come to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. This is indeed the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. May we pray. Gracious God, we pause now to hear your word. Silent in us any voice but your own, so we may hear and faithfully respond. Amen. Two rather short stories this morning, and then we're done. Dr. Preston. Dr. Preston had done quite well in his large city practice of plastic surgery. By the time he was 55, however, he had had enough. Enough of the people who passed through the office of a general practitioner turned into a plastic surgeon specialist. And it wasn't only in his practice that he had done well. His stature in the community was strong, and his social circle included people of importance, great power, and wealth. When he retired in his mid-fifties, Dr. Preston began to take on a different behavior as noticed by his friends. The first thing he did was announce to his associates that he was going to be traveling around the world, traveling abroad in some of the back, backward countries of the world to, to help with medical needs from their point of view. 
Now, that certainty didn't sound like skiing vacations that he enjoyed in the past with his colleagues and, and families enjoyed in Switzerland and their cruises down the Nile River and, and cruises in the Caribbean. His friends couldn't understand why he would choose to do such a strange thing. He was very comfortable. Why would he travel around the world trying to help out third world countries, trying to help with medical needs of those in distress? After some months, Dr. Preston came back looking very tired, worn out. And it turned out that he had suffered from malaria, contracted, contracted on his trip. And Preston's friends asked what he had done on his excursion. And the doctor replied that he had stopped at some hospitals and offered his help. And that explained how he must have picked up the disease. The recuperation from the trip took, took a long time. But then Dr. Preston announced that he was going back overseas. His friends were shocked. They were even more shocked when Preston asked them to contribute medical goods for his trip. He got what he wanted, and he disappeared for another six months. And when he came back, he looked as dreadful as before. To make a long story short, Dr. Preston no longer has more than a modest house to his name. He makes the rounds of all his acquaintances and medical supply stores buying up any kind of goods he can. He seeks some donated money so he can treat the poor. And his friends just can't understand why he would risk illness and even death to treat citizens of backward countries when he could be doing facelifts and tummy tucks in a well-lighted suburban clinic. To which Preston replies, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Second story. Dick Foster was, was the rather ambitious chair of the stewardship committee of Bethany Church. And Bethany had always run a very successful, if low-key, stewardship campaign. Giving always seemed to run behind in the summer times, like in many churches. But Bethany found the money to always pay, it bill, pay its bills and still give a good percentage of benevolence. The centennial of Bethany was approaching in two short years. And it had been decided by the board to completely remodel areas of the church, especially the kitchen and the fellowship hall. And they needed to come up with $500,000. And each given unit of Bethany would have to dig more deeply into their pockets to make this a successful plan. Dick Foster had secured information from the county offices showing the average income in his city. And he multiplied that by the number of giving units at Bethany, and he came up with a, a certain figure, a starting line figure. And he found out that Bethany members were giving only 2.5% of their income to the church. If all the people were to give 10%, Dick reasoned, there would be no need for a special drive because that extra 500000 would be covered again and again and again. So the campaign was aimed at those people who were pledging less than 10% of their income. It was ambitious, to say the least. But Dick thought it was fail-safe. That was before he ran into a certain church member. His name was Henry. And Henry owned the hardware store down the street. Henry had been a very faithful member of the church for decades, and he was nearing retirement from his work. And he had done real well, and he had put all his kids through a private college. But his giving to the church did not reflect his commitment to the church, according to Dick. And Dick could not understand that and tried to persuade or pressure Henry into tripling his giving to the church. Well, Henry simply said no. What he didn't say was that he thought it was a bit 
presumptuous of Dick to expect him to help pay for a 100 year anniversary party for his church. Sure, a sprucing up of the place would, would be helpful, but $500,000? Bethany was not hurting for space, really not hurting for money. The kitchen and the fellowship hall facilities were, were not modern, but they were well equipped and they were very adequate. After all, they weren't attempting to be the Peabody. Henry also didn't say this. He didn't say this. For years, he had personally paid for building materials that went to build homes for poor families in the hills of Kentucky. Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Though he got the material at a discount through his hardware store, it still cost a great deal more than 10% that Dick Foster wanted for him for the church. In Henry's mind, he was doing better than a tithe to the church. In Henry's mind, the money better belonged to the homeless than to those who wanted to simply spruce up the church to enlarge and beautify a home that was already large and beautiful. What is it that the Bible says? It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. What does make more sense? Treating sick and dying people? Or covering up wrinkles in, in surgery with liposuction? What makes more sense? Building a home for the homeless? Or completely remodeling a church that really doesn't need remodeling? What makes more sense? Jesus dining with sinners or dining with people who don't need his saving grace. It bothered the religious leaders that Jesus associated with sinners with the down and out, with the outcast. I ask you this morning, what bothers us today in the church of Jesus Christ? Do we want to, to get very close to the poor. Do we want to send money to third world countries or use it to remodel our bathrooms and build swimming pools? Or maybe do both. As we resume in-person worship, which is certainly glorious news, <coughs> as we resume in-person worship, I believe we need to Look at ourselves as a church. We need to take a good look around. After all, when you look around, we are indeed a very attractive group, right? A very good looking group. Certainly, we are indeed a huge credit to our community. But there are some people who may feel shut out. Maybe because of their economic status or the color of their skin, or because of a lifestyle they have acquired, let me ask you a question. Who are you here for? The well or the sick? Maybe there are persons that this church need to be reaching out to. Some lonely young person perhaps, some fatherless child some economically challenged family. Who are you here for? Who are we here for? The sick or the well? Thanks be to God. Amen. May we now affirm our faith as we say together the affirmation of faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May we pray. Gracious God, we pray this day, this Sunday during the Lenten season, we pray that you will secure our steps on rough terrain, on shifting sands, on fine, wide roads, on narrow paths. Make our footsteps firm. Secure our steps, O oh God, in, in the boardroom, at the water cooler, in the schoolyard, in the checkout line. Make our footsteps firm. Secure our steps, O oh God, chasing after deadlines, trailing after toddlers, scrambling toward the finish line, clamoring for security. Make our footsteps firm. Secure our steps, O oh God, pacing through hospitals, wandering through the hurt, tripping over the unforeseen, meandering through, through the grief. Make our footsteps firm. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our one Lord and Savior. Amen. And now listen carefully to the good news. God goes ahead of you to be your guide. And God is beside you to be your friend. God is behind you to encourage you. God is above and below you to sustain you. So whoever you are and wherever you go in God's good creation and whatever happens of good or of ill, remember that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Amen.